Brothers and sisters, welcome to the LDS Fishers of Men podcast. I am your host, Alan, and uh, we are here with episode two. Already on to the second week, second episode. Um, and in case you guys hadn't noticed, I went ahead and I implemented a midweek spiritual boost playlist. Um, it's available on YouTube. And it's also, I put it in the RSS feed, so uh, we, if you enjoy listening on iTunes, uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, should be up on all of those. I think we're even up on iHeartRadio now, so if you uh, prefer those, those platforms, then we should be on there. The link will be in the description. Um, I appreciate the support that uh, we've had so far. I appreciate the words of encouragement, encouragement, and I hope that the podcast will be of a benefit to someone, at least someone, going forward. Um, this is not something that is ever going to make money. That is not why I'm doing it, and if I had the chance to make money, I would turn it down. Uh, this is this this is and it needs to be something that is free from even the appearance of priestcraft or anything like that. And I noticed that I've seen some of um, some of the other YouTube channels and stuff who have gone ahead and done the monetization thing. And you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not pointing any fingers or anything like that. But it just it's you know, for me, I'm going to. Uh, choose to do this on my own. I'm going to choose to actually have it cost me a little bit of money. Um, and I really am trying to help. You know, that's why this is addressed to to my people. You know, this. I, I and if, if a non-member wants to listen, absolutely, feel free. You know, you're more than welcome. Every, everybody's welcome. Um... But this this message is to really is to my people, and uh, I think today we're we're going to continue on, kind of in the same vein as what we were talking about last week. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about um, the importance of the keys. Now, when you hear me say that. What comes to mind when you hear me say the word keys? Obviously, we're, we're talking in the religious mindset here. And so, you might be thinking priesthood keys. You might have been thinking about your, your car keys, right? Um, it's one of those things that, uh, that I think that we need to remember as we go forward here. Especially in these last days. The whole reason why we're doing this, why we're talking about this stuff, is because a portion of us as a church audience, as a church membership, as fellow saints, we have forgotten the importance of the mouthpiece and of the keys. I have heard and seen a number of people, uh, some of them who are very close to me, who are advocating through Facebook, who are advocating through other avenues uh, such as YouTube and, you know, some people that I don't know but that I know are, are saints, are LDS, part of the same uh, religious upbringing and fold that, that I'm a part of, who are saying some very alarming things about about both the the mouthpiece about the brethren and also uh, misconstruing the keys. So think about the meaning of the keys and what those are as we go forward here. I've got some scriptures as, as any good religious podcast should have. I think that we're going to have to do some deep dives here and I've got some, some content 
Um, so I should probably quit yakking and get into it. Let's go ahead and let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33. And I think we're going to go verses... Let's go 1 through 13 here. We'll start out. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to, thy, to, to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman, if, when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come, and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore thou shalt not, or thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. I'm going to pause here for a second and read that one more time. So thou, this is verse 7, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. Let's pause, because this is very important. What is it about our religion that separates us and uh, sets us apart from everybody else, from all the other Christian religions? Because I served my mission in Texas, and I heard all the time, that all you need is to accept Christ into your heart. Sometimes you even say a little prayer, and you are saved. You're good. That's it. I am seeing my own people, a portion of us who are adopting that type of doctrine. And it's coming at a time when, as I spoke last week, there's, a, there's an inconvenience, right, that's, that, that's happened to happen. And I suspect, depending on who you are, this is something that may arise in every generation. We know what happened in Joseph Smith's time. There were things that he would bring up that people would... Uh, just completely freak out about, right? How many times have we seen, you know, in, in church history, and this is portrayed very well in the Work and the Glory books as well as the movies, the, the couple movies that they did anyway, where they talk about, oh, Joseph, he's, he's lost his gift. You know, he's, he's speaking as a man. He's not speaking as a prophet with this bit of advice here, you know. And if you look, I mean, if you look at history, you know, most of the time, the membership is what screwed things up. <laughs> it was the membership, right? They just weren't up to par. Yet, uh, the fault would always be thrown at Joseph. We are reliving that today. It's, it really is a cycle. I'm hearing people who are saying, look... No man should get between you and Jesus. No, no man, you know, no, no one man should, should ever uh, get between you and the revelation that you get from Christ. Oh my goodness. It's one of those things where you say, did you, especially if you're a return missionary, it's like, did, did you forget everything? 
Did you forget everything that we taught, that we were instructed in the MTC? Keeping in mind that that stuff that we that we were taught to teach, you know, potential investigators and investigators, that was all given by revelation, right? That's stuff that's that's given down from the mouthpiece to the twelve apostles. Like they have a huge hand in that. One of the biggest things, brothers and sisters, is when I hear things like that, they are taking the prophet and completely demeaning the office of said prophet. <laughs> they do the same thing with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Well, he, he's just a man. You know, he's a fallible man. Yeah, he's a fallible man who just so happens to have been hand-picked by the great Jehovah to serve as part of his foundation, right? Remember that whole uh, Second Thessalonians thing? Prophets, teachers, priests, you know, evangelists, so forth, all, all that, you know, apostles, all that stuff that uh, they're just men, right? Oh, it's sad we have to talk about this. Again, I'm not up on my ramiumptum. This is this is just elementary, dear Watson. Right? <laughs> this is elementary stuff here. This is stuff that we are taught to teach to people who know zero about our religion. The importance of a prophet, right? Amos three seven, huge uh, missionary scripture, scripture mastery. Surely the Lord God will doeth nothing, save he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets, right? The watchman is the prophet. The prophet is the watchman. So think about that as we continue on here, and as you contemplate the things that we've just read. The watchman even in this context, right, going back to old school days where sword and, sword and shield, right, or whatever, thick clothing, you know, buffalo hide, cow hide, whatever you had as a shield, bows and arrows, right, spears, javelins. The watchman was not just a man, <laughs> even in those days, right? Watchman was a very important person. It wasn't just a man. He just happens. He just so happens to be a man, right? That's the same thing with with our prophet, who is our watchman. The whole point of this parable, brothers and sisters, fellow saints, is that the watchman can see things that we cannot. He is handpicked by the great Jehovah, right? Yehoshua Amashiach Ben Elohim. Okay, the same. Old school, going back to the Old Testament, okay? The great Jesus Christ, the Messiah, handpicked by him to be the mouthpiece, to be the foundation, a part of that foundation, with Christ being the chief cornerstone. I don't want to belabor the point too much here, but I really want to stress that importance. He has authority given to him to be the watchman. Okay, now let's move on. Verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Okay, that's, that's some weight on our, uh, our watchman's shoulders there. <laughs> Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, 
how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Gosh, this is good stuff. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous, righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for the righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Boom. <laughs> that's huge. That's some that's some serious deep waters that we're going into here. Verse 11 is how I look at this and how I look at us, right? Because I am here with you. I am I am with you guys. And when I hear the saints my fellow saints say things such as the prophet is just a man, the watchman, right? He's just some dude. And he should not get between you and your relationship with Christ. If that is not the philosophies of men mingled with Scripture, I don't know what is. That is, that is some prime rib philosophy of men mingled with Scripture. Jesus Christ is the truth and the way. The great Jehovah, right? The Messiah. He is the way. Period. He has set up his foundation. He has built his church. This is all his idea. <laughs> Having a prophet is his idea, you guys. Like, It, it really is one of those things where when you hear stuff like that, it almost renders you speechless. Because you're like, you, you're using the Savior as an argument against the Savior, right? Why would he go through and waste all this time? He has the power to do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't have to use people. But he chooses to. And that should say volumes to us. I'm, 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 I'm chomping at the bit here. I got so much stuff that I want to that I want to say and I want to add, but I really I need to I need to continue reading here because I want to paint a picture for you guys. Okay, so let's go to now that we've read our Ezekiel stuff, right? Let's go ahead and let's go to the Old Testament student manual. Fantastic resource, by the way, that you can look up for free on churchofjesuschrist.org. They've got all of them on there, and they are amazing. So let's go to Ezekiel 33, right? So let's go to the Old Testament student manual, uh, chapter 27, page 281. Okay, where it shows uh, 27 through 13, Ezekiel 33, 2 through 9. I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Ezekiel 33, 2 through 9. 
reiterates the teachings about the watchman found in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. I would suggest you go back and read that. Elder Spencer W. Kimball explained the need to have a watchman. So here's a watchman, somebody handpicked by the Savior to tell us something. Now let's listen to what he has to say. I am sure that Peter and James and Paul found it unpleasant business to constantly be calling people to repentance and warning them of dangers, but they continue unflinchingly. So we, your leaders, must be everlastingly at it. If young people do not understand, then the fault may be partly ours. But if we make the true way clear to you, then we are blameless. So I wish today to help define meanings of words and acts for you young people, to fortify you against error, anguish, pain, and sorrow. Brothers and sisters, they gain no monetary value from doing the things that they do. They gain no... Their rewards are not of this world. And the kingdoms that they will inherit are not of this world for what they are doing. For giving themselves over. To the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's for us. It's for our benefit. It is how Christ is speaking to us. And if you are receiving revelation contrary to that of the keys, to that of the watchman, if the watchman is yelling down and telling you that there's an army coming, and uh, you are receiving revelation that, nah, there's no army coming. Uh, you're either listening to a false spirit or you're lying to yourself. Or you're just lying, right? It, it really is just that simple. Let's go and see what uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who is Alan's MVP, right? Let's see what he has to say about the keys. Two different usages of the term keys are found in the revelations. One has reference to the direct power given whereby the church or kingdom and all its organizations are governed. The keys of the kingdom being the powers of presidency. The other usage ref refers to the means provided whereby something is revealed, discovered, or made manifest. Thus Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were given the keys to translate and bring hidden scriptures to light. And thus Joseph held the keys of the mysteries and the revelations which are sealed. And there's a bunch of scripture references uh, along with these, and I'll give you guys the, the citation at the end here. Meaning that he had the power and means at his disposal to bring these things to light and reveal them to the world. Similarly, the higher priesthood holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. For it is only in and through and because of that priesthood that the mysteries of the kingdom can be learned and the knowledge of God obtained. The keys of the ministering of angels are resident in the Aaronic priesthood. And the Melchizedek priesthood holds the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens opened unto them, to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn, right? To commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. President Joseph F. Smith said, What is a key? It is the right or privilege which belongs to and comes with the priesthood to have communication with God. Is not that a key? Most decidedly. 
we may not enjoy the blessings or key very much. But the key is in the priesthood. It is the right to enjoy the blessings of communication with the heavens, and the privilege and authority to administer in the ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. That is a key. You who hold the priesthood have the key or the authority, the right, the power or privilege to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And that is uh, Bruce R. McConkie, Gospel Doctrine, 5th edition, page 142. That is some good stuff. <laughs> really is some good stuff in there. And you start to see how some of those things that we are hearing our, our brethren and sisters saying, they just don't hold water and they melt away real quick. But wait a minute, maybe, maybe Bruce R. McCocky was just a man. Maybe he was just some dude, right? That kind of, that kind of thinking and logic is exhausting, brothers and sisters. I am, as I, as I read that, I'm reminded of what we're talking about in Come Follow Me this week, right? Uh, we do our, our family night on Sunday, so we, we did ours and we talked about Abraham. Abraham was a prophet, right? Uh, the head of his dispensation, okay? Abraham... You know, I've heard a lot of people refer to him as being just like a guy in the wilderness, and he is the example, right? He is the prime example of, of not having to need a mouthpiece or somebody in between you and Christ, right? That whole argument is just so weird because it's like, we, you guys, we, we're supposed to have a personal relationship with Christ, and I think we're conflating two different things. We are absolutely supposed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, right? We're supposed to seek for a sacred grove experience. However, we will never rece receive revelation that is contrary to what the brethren are saying and to what the mouthpiece, the watchman, the prophet is handing down to us through revelation, through the priesthood authority of the said keys that we are reading about here and that we're learning about right now. Let us also remember, Father Abraham, who did he pay his tithes to? Right? Melchizedek. There's organization. There is, you know, there is a community. There is a church of the firstborn. There is, God's house is a house of order. Things are done a certain way. It's not just willy-nilly, and it's not however you feel at that moment, right? We live in a, in a time when we are blessed to have these things at our disposal. And when they were gone, in the primitive church, right? When, when the apostles were killed, when John the Beloved was taken from the people because of their wickedness, and they, he wasn't allowed to be among them anymore, which parallels, by the way, uh, over on the other side of the world in, in America, how they had the, uh, the three Nephites, right? Eventually, they were taken from among the people because the people became wicked. And everything fell into apostasy. We can look back to the early church fathers, right? The, the, the Padres, right? Clement of Alexandria, uh, Jerome, all these guys. You can go back to some of this stuff, and they are like yearning for the doctrine of the apostles. And they could tell the difference 
they were tasting the fruit of the uh, of the Gnostics. They were tasting the fruit of, of these people who were not inspired. And who said, you know what? I don't think this book should be in the Bible. Let's let's have a council of Nicaea and let's let's vote and decide. Uh, <laughs> you know. Council of Nicaea is a, I can almost do a whole podcast on that. That was interesting. Um that was something where they were under duress as well by the emperor, right, to, to come up with some stuff, and they were definitely leaned on to go a certain way on a lot of things. Not a lot of revelation there. We are so lucky with what we have, and we are trampling it under our feet whenever we go on Facebook and we post things that are, dare I say, ill-speaking of the Lord's anointed. Something that if you are an endowed member in good standing, right, or if you've ever been an endowed member, you made a covenant that that would be something that you would be shying away from. And I've seen people post things about apostles and criticizing them hardcore because of their stance on whatever. Lately, it's been the vaccine. Lately, it's been the masks. Okay, It's happened all throughout my life that I can look back on and be like, oh yeah, I remember that guy talking about that. Oh yeah, I remember him talking about that. Oh yeah, let's go back to Brigham Young and talk about him, and let's criticize him. Oh yeah, let's go back to Joseph Smith and criticize him. That kind of thing is what is rotting our church to the core. And the ones that are going to suffer for it are us. We're, we're, we're doing it to ourselves. And I don't think the Lord looks kindly on that type of thing. Again, emphasizing the point that he handpicked these people. The Son of God himself handpicked these people to be a part of the foundation, be a part of his church, the church of the firstborn, right? Um, let's do, let's do another, another um, quote by Bruce R. McConkie here, because he really just lays it out very well. Uh, the keys of the kingdom. Oh, and before I continue here, I was, I was actually kind of led towards this towards some of these resources uh, by Micah over at the two LDS archives. Does a fantastic job. If you guys ever get a chance, check out a bunch of his stuff because he goes into some deep dives. Uh, very inspiring. And uh, does, just does a great job. You know, he doesn't cite anything that is not from the brethren or from scripture. Anything else, toss it out. Uh, going forward here, keys of the kingdom. Keys are the right of presidency, the directing, controlling, governing power. Now I want to stop here. I know I'm stopping already. Governing power. Do we understand what it means to be governed? To have a holy order after the Son of God. A governing power, right? Just want to throw that out there. The keys of the kingdom are the power, right, and authority to preside over the kingdom of God on earth, which is the church, and to direct all of its affairs. President Joseph F. Smith taught, every man ordained to any degree of the priesthood has this authority delegated to him. That's very important. But it is necessary that every act performed under this authority shall be done at the proper time and place in the proper way and after the proper order. The power of directing these labors constitutes the keys of the priesthood. In their fullness, the keys are held by only one person at a time, the prophet and president of the church. He may delegate any portion of this power to another in which case that person holds the keys of that particular labor. Thus the president of a temple, the president of a stake, the bishop of a ward, the president of a mission, 
the president of a quorum. Each holds the keys of the labors performed in that particular body or locality. His priesthood is not increased by this special appointment, for a seventy who presides over a mission has no more priesthood than a seventy who labors under his direction. And the president of an elder's quorum, for example, has no more priesthood than any member of that quorum. But he holds the power of directing the official labors performed in the mission or the quorum, or, in other words, the keys of that division of that work. So it is throughout all the ramifications of the priesthood. A distinction must be carefully made between the general authority and the directing of the labors performed by that authority. A lot of people really struggle. And Joseph Smith even talks about this. Maybe I'll have to see if I can find that quote. Maybe I'll use that for, for the description of the of the video. That might be a good idea. He talks about how it is the natural inclination of man to kind of buck the system, right? To be like, oh, I don't want to be told what to do, you know? And I think that we can see that. I think we all have seen that as evidenced as when, you know, when somebody has uh, been asked to do something, that they don't want to do, right? I know going back to in my younger days, right? There'd be uh, young men who'd be getting ready to go on missions and there'd be young men who'd say, yeah, just, you know, I think that, uh, I think the military is going to be my mission. And, and I say this as a army veteran, right? It's like, no, that's a cop out. Uh, the Lord wants you to serve a mission. That that's sorry. That's just how it is. Every young man is to serve a mission. If you you know, and this isn't to make anybody feel bad who did not serve. That's that's not the point. Don't mis, don't misunderstand me here. The, what I'm saying here is that every young man has been commanded by a mouthpiece, by a watchman, that he who is worthy should go forth and share. Should go forth and serve right? Anything less than that is, is rebelling against that, against that commandment. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person. That doesn't mean that you won't be, you know, that you won't be forgiven for that or anything like that. I'm just saying. I remember seeing that and I remember hearing about that and stuff. And that, you know, that's one example among many that we could list here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep reading here. Through the ages, various prophets have held various keys by virtue of which they have been empowered to use their priesthood to perform specified labors. Now, the, here's where we get some important stuff. Adam holds the keys of presidency over all dispensations and is the presiding high priest under Christ over all the earth. Wait a minute, we can't let a man get between us and, and Christ and God, right? That, that, that can't happen. Even if it is just a, a, a glorified, resurrected man, right? Michael himself. He's not going to get between me and God, right? Guys, let's not misunderstand here. Okay, this is one of those things. Everything is done in wisdom and order. God's house is a house of order. The holy order after the Son of God, right? He has things set up the way He wants it to be set up. Whenever we are given revelation, whenever we are given counsel from the brethren, from the prophet, you know, whether it is by my voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. This is what separates us from everybody else. We have a living, breathing lifeline between us and Christ. <sighs> Continuing on. It's going to take me forever if I, keep, if I keep blabbing about this stuff, but I think it's important that we point out some of these things. Noah 
stands next to Adam in priesthood authority. And after these two come all the heads of the different gospel dispensations, together with a host of other mighty prophets. For example, Elijah held the keys of the sealing power in ancient Israel, as did Nephi the son of Helaman among the Nephites in the early years of the Christian era. One man named Elias held the keys of authority in the days of Abraham. Yeah, that's another guy besides Melchizedek, right? While to, while to another bearing the same name has been committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began concerning the last days. Moroni holds the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. Wait a minute. And I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but I'm trying to prove a point. So, there was a, a man standing between uh, Christ and Joseph Smith. I don't care if he was a glorified, resurrected man. He's just a man, right? No. That was his, that was his stewardship, right? He held the keys. And this is all under the direction of the Lord himself. Okay, let's go forward. John the Baptist, the keys of the Aaronic priesthood and the gospel of repentance. Right, we remember uh, John the Baptist is the one who came and gave that authority by the laying on of hands as a glorified resurrected being to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Interesting how God does things, right? How the, how the Son of God does things under God's direction. He uses us, us men to get a lot of stuff done, doesn't he? And that's to our benefit. Moses, those whereby the priesthood may be used to gather Israel and lead the ten tribes from the lands of the north. Peter, James, and John hold the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And Raphael, whose mortality or whose mortal identity has not been revealed, holds the keys of his dispensation. That would be fun to figure out who Raphael was. Going back to Peter, D James, and John, right? Who gave, who gave Joseph Smith the Melchizedek priesthood? Could Christ not have just come and, and done that? They were sent under the direction of Christ himself because that is their stewardship. Again, to our benefit. The mortals, right? All of these and others... Diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time have come in the last days, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood. Thus Joseph Smith and his successors, I'm going to read that one more time. Thus Joseph Smith and his successors have been and are possessors of all of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, even as these were held by Peter and the ancient apostles. Notice he singles out Peter, the chief apostle. Okay? And accordingly, those so empowered have power to govern all the affairs of the earthly kingdom and direct the administration of all the ordinances of salvation and exaltation for worthy recipients. The keys of the kingdom belong always unto the presidency of the high priesthood. Wow. Let's, let's just take that one in. The keys, I'm going to read it again. The keys of the kingdom belong always unto the presidency of the high priesthood. Boy, that is... That is some, some weight on some shoulders. Can you imagine that? Let's continue on. And only one man on earth at a time, the president of the church, can exercise them in their fullness. This necessarily must be so because keys are the right of presidency, and there cannot be two equal heads. Otherwise, the Lord's house would not be a house of order, but of confusion. Let's stop there again. 
Have you seen recently, and this could be in the past as well, think about your own sphere of influence and those who, whose sphere of influence you are a part of. Have you seen people become prophets unto themselves? Have you seen people discount the counsel, the urgings of the brethren? in favor of their own revelation, which goes in direct opposition to the mouthpiece, to the watchman, to the prophet, to the apostles. I hope I'm painting a picture here. It should be crystal clear. It's not prophet worship. It's not anything like that, right? The Lord's house is a house of order, and He is the one who built the house. He just so happens to give us mortals, us fallible mortal men, stewardships and keys for our benefit. And by the way, if those guys screw things up, the penalty is pretty dang severe. Like Judas Iscariot. Severe. We're talking about playing for keeps here. Continuing on. I know this is long, but the, guys, this is gold. This is gold. Get into the right spirit and listen to this, because this is gold. All of the keys of the kingdom, however, are conferred upon every man, sustained as a member of the council of the twelve. Thus, when a member of the Council of the Twelve becomes the senior apostle of God on earth, he can exercise in their fullness the keys which theretofore have lain dormant in him. The keys of the kingdom, the right and power to govern the Lord's affairs for and on his behalf, have been held by prophets in all ages. But when the Lord comes to reign personally upon the earth during the millennial era, he will take back the keys. Those who have held them will make an accounting to him of their stewardships at the place called Adam on Diamond, at which gathering Christ will receive dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Eventually, in the celestial day, the keys of the kingdom shall be delivered up again unto the Father. Man, that is some... That is some heavy, yet crystal clear doctrine. You can find that also, uh, Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine. Uh, which I believe you can find online for free, a PDF of it. Let's think about what we've read, and let's, let's digest this for a minute, brothers and sisters. Let's really digest this. And if this is hard for you to hear, if you have been one of those people that have gone on Facebook, that have created a YouTube channel and spoken out and are leading your brothers and sisters away from the mouthpiece. The people who are in the tower, right? The watchmen who can see things that we cannot. If you have been telling them to listen to you instead of the brethren or to seek revelation elsewhere, about said circumstance, you know, circumstance, and you fill in the blank. I'm not up here on my ramiumptum. I am in, in, I'm in the ocean with you. And I'm saying, please don't take off your life jacket. Or better yet, I'm we're in a boat, right? 
we're in a boat. Christ is at the helm, right? We can't see Christ. He's in. The, he's he's in there. He's, he's he's driving the boat, right? But he's shouting to to the, the first mate in the crow's nest, right? He's got a he's got a radio to him, and he's telling him directions to give us. And you want to. You, you, not only do you want to jump into the ocean, you want to take your life jacket off? I beg you to reconsider that. And I'm not trying to have a prideful tone. I'm not saying I am great. You know, in, in, in the words of Ephraim Hanks, right? I have more sins that I can count. I have more flaws than I can count. But I do try. And I am trying. And I do have anxiety. And I do care about what happens to you. And if I get to the judgment bar and I stand before Christ... And I will stand with a bright recollection of all of my guilt, of all the stupid things that I've done in my life. I don't want him to say, you knew. Alan, you knew this. I spoke this to you. Through the Spirit to your heart, you knew this and you didn't tell your brethren. You didn't tell your sisters. You didn't tell your fellow saints this simple, true doctrine. Why? I can think of no good excuse, brothers and sisters. I can't think of any good excuse to give the Lord in a situation like that. I have been offended. I have had people who were extraordinarily close to me. Go on the attack. because of my adherence, my strict adherence to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and especially this doctrine of adhering to the mouthpiece, of putting myself into subjection and to, you know, putting myself under the governing power of the keys of the priesthood, of the mouthpiece, of the apostles. That has created a rift between me and other people. It has been a point of disagreement with a lot of people that I have contact with. And it's hard to not want to throw a, a haymaker back when you're getting attacked. Very hard. But for me, it really was a gut check. You know, I, I really had to stand. I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, Are you a Christian for real? Are you actually a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you going to fire back? Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Not when things get this real. This is my response. 
to friend, to people who would call me foe, to people who I don't know, my brothers and sisters, all of you, and I love all of you, I do. Even those of you, you know, those of you who, who may find this a hard message to hear, who are railing against me, maybe, maybe you'll do it in the comments, I don't know. It doesn't bother me, I'm just saying, you know. I really, truly do love and care about what happens to you. That's why I'm doing this. So that at least on this one thing, I can look into the Savior's eyes and hold my head up high and say, Master, I told them. I, I, I did my best. I left my testimony on as many platforms as I could. I didn't seek for the money. I didn't seek for, not that there's any money to be made in any anyway. But I, you know, I truly am just We have stuff coming down the pike, you guys, that it, it just is. If you look back on history and you compare it with prophetic statements with scripture, revelations. The times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. We're, we're at that point. We stand on the precipice of tribulation. And all of the stuff that has been happening recently is a gateway to apostasy. And you may find that you have already started down that road. It really is not too late. Check your ego at the door. Humble yourself. And try to undo any damage you may have done. Whether that be on Facebook, YouTube. Like I said last, last week, I had to eat some humble pie. And say, you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong. When the, when the mouthpiece says something, they are right. And I am wrong. And that goes with this podcast. 110%. I'm going to read another scripture here in Doctrine and Covenants, section 81, verses 1 and 2. Verily, verily, I say unto you, my servant Frederick G. Williams, listen to the voice of him who speaketh to the word of the Lord your God, and hearken to the calling wherewith you are called, even to be a high priest in my church, and a counselor unto my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., unto whom... I have given the keys of the kingdom, which belong always unto the presidency of the high priesthood. Let's now go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 4. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason there hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. I really could dive into Hebrews, especially. That is so huge. That is so good. 
that is meaty right there. Please, I implore you, brothers and sisters, to look into Hebrews chapter 5, especially verses 1 and 4, with the things that we've been talking about in mind, and really chew on that. Again, chew on that down to the bone. That is, there is some good stuff in there. Really good stuff. I'm about at the hour mark here, but I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to really think about it. What happens when we disregard the keys and the ch and the administration of the Lord? Think about that. When Moses was with the children of Israel and they were bitten by those venomous, fiery serpents, right? And he went out and he created the brazen serpent, right? Under the direction of the Lord, I might add. He then holds it up and says, guys, just look at the, just look at the brazen serpent and you'll be healed. I wonder if there was anybody in that crowd that started to say, you know what? I've seen all the stuff that, uh, that the Lord has done for us. And you know what? Moses has been, he's been bugging me lately. Who says that I have to listen to Moses? If the Lord truly is telling me this thing, I'm just going to ask the Lord. I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to ask him to see if he actually wants me to look at this brazen serpent thing. I mean, heck, may maybe there's some, uh, some lead in that brazen serpent. That sucker probably isn't even safe to have around, right? I wonder, in that, in that instance, I wonder how the Lord going to, you know, let's, let, let's, let's change our perspective here. What does the Lord think and feel when he receives prayers like that? It makes me think of, <laughs> I'm doing a, a story within a story here. It's like a dream within a dream. Think about that guy that was in the, uh, He's, you know, he, he's in a flood area, and his house starts to get flooded, and he prays, Lord, please deliver me from this flood. A dude on a uh, rowboat rows by and says, hey, get in, man, I got you. Let's get out of here. You're, you're, you're good. You're in luck. I saw you. I'm here. I got room. Let's get to safety. The guy who's on top of his house in the flood says, No, the Lord's going to save me. I just talked to the Lord, and uh, he has assured me that he's going to save me. I'm getting revelation right now. Yep, he's going to save me. You're good. Go ahead. Guy says, Okay. Takes off. Right? Flood gets higher and higher. Guy's getting a little bit worried, but he's got faith. No, I'm good. I'm good. The Lord has assured me. He's given me revelation that I am going to be saved. He's going to he's going to save me. Right. Eventually, you know, uh, you know, a uh, an evac, a, a, a helicopter, you know, evac shows up. Dude, the water's up to your your waist. You're on your house. Let's go, man. This is it. I can't, you know, he, this is your last chance. No, the Lord said he's, I'm, I'm holding out till the very end. I'm ready to die if I have to because the Lord has assured me. But I know I'm not going to die because the Lord has assured me that he's going to save me. Dude dies. He drowns. Shows up to the pearly gates. Lord, you told me you were going to save me. What, what what happened? What does the Lord respond? 
I sent you the dude in the rowboat. I, you know, I sent you all these people. Even I, I even sent you the, the the you know the rescue guy on the on the on the, uh, the the helicopter. I gave you all these chances. I was gonna you know I was gonna rescue you. I tried. You would not allow me to rescue you. When we think about things that way, it kind of kind of becomes silly, doesn't it? You know, we, going back to the brazen serpent, I think a lot of us judge the children of Israel very harshly. And we think about it, we're like, gosh, these guys were morons. What the heck? We see all these miracles happening, right? And yet they won't even look. I wonder how many of them you know, as, as the story goes, and as we always hear, it was just, it, it was too simple, right? It was just too simple. There's no way that that's all I have to do is just look with my eyeballs. I have to turn my eyeballs a couple of degrees to either direction, wherever I'm at, and behold this thing, and then I'm saved. No way. No, as a matter of fact, I'm going to pray to the Lord right now. And he's going to save me. Because he's done all this miraculous stuff. He's going to save me. I wonder how many of them got to the other side and had a similar conversation as the dude who was standing on his house in the flood in our parable story. Hey, I provided you, you know, I provided you with a, uh, with a way It really is that simple. If we humble ourselves, if we if we just take part and do our job. If we if we measure if we fulfill the measure of our creation and as we as we do so faithfully not just as far as living, having a family. I'm talking about church callings. You know what I mean? Magnifying those church callings, uh, ministering and stuff, which I need to start doing better on. You know, this whole COVID thing makes it, it makes it hard. In the end, that's just an excuse. You know, we, we need to do the things and they really are primary things. They're primary answers. As we, uh, as we get to this where I need to start closing up here, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people fall. I was speaking to a buddy of mine who we've been friends since we were young. We grew up in, in a ward together. We both are living in that same ward now. I think out of 12 priests, right? Dudes who bless the sacrament. I think out of 12 of us priests, years ago, there's maybe two of us, uh, maybe three. Who are you know, faithfully attending, serving, magnifying, at least trying to magnify our callings, right? Like, obviously none of us three are perfect. But we are trying tooth and nail. We're fighting and we're, we're trying to teach our kids the gospel. We're trying to... We have anxiety, you know, for for where we're at in the history of the human family. I wonder how much of this stuff 
would have been avoided just by adherence to the watchman on the tower, by adherence to the, the church administration, to the keys, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord, I think, can sum up um, the best advice to us. Uh, let's go to D&C 38, 23 through 28. But verily I say unto you, teach one another according to the office wherewith I have appointed you. And let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again I say unto you, let every man esteem his brother as himself. For what man among you, having twelve sons, and is no respecter of them, and they serve him obediently, and he saith unto the one, Be thou clothed in robes, and sit thou here. And to the other, Be thou clothed in rags, and sit thou here, and looketh upon his sons, and saith, I am just. Behold, this I have given unto you as a parable. And it is even as I am, I say unto you, Be one. And if ye are not one, ye are not mine. And again I say unto you that the enemy is that the enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. Boy, those last two verses there, they really have some weight, don't they? I think we forget that we have been commanded to become one with Christ, who is one with the Father, right? The commandment to be one was issued to the prophet and apostles of the day. They are commanded to be one. And if you go into some of the church administration as to how things get done in Salt Lake City, by the brethren, they are commanded to be one. It is our challenge to strive to become one with the brethren and with Christ and with the Father, with Adam, the Ancient of Days, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, right? Moses. Brother Joseph. You know what I'm saying? Everybody. Peter, James, and John, we are commanded to be one. And that last verse right there, I think, is important for us to remember because... This last verse is playing a part at this point in time. The enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. I think that we forget that we have constant opposition in the spiritual realm that has a ways of manifesting itself in our temporal realm, in our mortal simulation that we're in. Because we are immortal beings, right? It's like we're here in this mortal simulation to get this experience, to get this body, and to be tested. This is one of those tests, brothers and sisters. I've given you a lifeline. I've given you a mouthpiece. Are you going to adhere to him as you would to me? Are you going to subject yourself to the church administration, to the keys, the authority, the priesthood? 
or are you going to become a prophet unto yourself? Do you know better? These really are dangerous waters that I see people swimming in. I recently saw somebody who posted something on Facebook and it was, you know, it's, it's, it's people taking scriptures, taking instances where something is trying to be taught. There's a, there, there's a lesson to be had and then using that circumstance to go against something that Christ himself has set up and that something himself has, has taught and has, you know, not just put his seal of approval on it, but in spades has hammered the point home that we are to have a mouthpiece. We are to have a watchman, a man on the tower, right? Beware the philosophies of men mingled with Scripture. Beware people trying to da Vinci code things that the prophet is saying. When he comes out with things for us, it is from God. It is from Jesus Christ. It is the things that the Lord would say if he were here with us. That's the whole point of having the mouthpiece. That's why it's called the mouthpiece. You know, whenever we stand in to give a blessing to somebody, who are we standing in for? Do we remember that? Brothers and sisters, I am a... I am just a man. If anybody was just a man, it's me. And again, I echo the words of Ephraim, Ephraim Hanks. I have more flaws than I can count. but I try. And I think that's what makes us worthy. I have anxiety for you. I do love and I do care about you. And anybody who has wronged me, I, I've already made that decision that anybody who has fired some torpedoes into the SS Allen, right? I, w I, abs I would forgive him tomorrow. I bear no ill will towards anybody. It's a funny thing when something that you have been taught all your life becomes a rubber meets the road scenario. And you now have to actually put it into practice. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's weird. It's no longer, it's no longer something you just talk about or hear about or read about in the scriptures. It's actually happening, right? We're seeing a sifting take place. And that, that sieve, that sifting, right, that the Lord uses... It goes both to the right and the left. And what you have left after that sifting has taken place amongst the right and the left, those are the people who are ready and able. They have the right stuff to redeem Zion. 
to succeed where our forefathers uh, have failed. And that little piece of uh, information, I think, is what we're going to... That, that's a little bit of a foreshadow for next week's podcast. So I'll leave you on a cliffhanger with that, but... Don't allow political beliefs, don't allow worldviews, don't allow any of that to get in the way of your salvation. It's not worth it. Again, I love you. I pray for you. I pray that the Spirit has attended. I have done everything in my power to get into the Spirit so that I could deliver something that would be of worth to you guys. And there is spiritual opposition, for sure, to this podcast. I'm going to close with my testimony. I know that the church is true. I know that Joseph Smith was indeed a prophet of God. I know that each subsequent prophet has stood in place and has held the keys and that they, just as Joseph did, receive communion and communication from the great Jehovah. And that the church is being guided by Christ. That Christ is at the helm of this ship. I know that the Book of Mormon is Scripture. I know that we are in the last days of the last days and that we must be on guard more than ever. And with that, I say to you, brothers and sisters, hold on to the rod. Hold on to the iron rod. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.